Right, so you have a, a classy handout, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll work with that and uh, we go into. Uh, Well, I'm going to just use this. Hmm? On the what? Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, God. All right. That's pretty bad. Did it. So, um, all right. So, I want to talk about this uh, uh, new <coughs> report, and it uh, reflects. Uh, a new assessment that we've uh, put in place and worked on for the last few week, uh, years, and it is uh, the first year that we're reporting out on the KRA. The KRA is one of two components of a uh, Ready for Kindergarten assessment system, and that includes, as I mentioned, the KRA and the Early Learning Assessment. That's an assessment um, a formative in nature from 36 to 72 months, and the uh, rollout of the ELA uh, will be in the summer. We're still finalizing the development of it, and it'll be in, uh, available to our pre-kindergarten teachers, the Head Start child care programs, uh, as well as uh, preschool special ed teachers who will be using it as part of their uh, child outcome summary process, the cause process. Um, so the um, KRA is really a replacement of what we had in place with the Maryland Model for School Readiness. It builds on the MMSR in terms of an assessment construct that's um, uh, different, but it comes from the same thinking that when we are looking at school readiness, we're looking at domains of learning, not just one particular domain, but several domains. And they include um, social foundations, uh, language literacy, um, physical development, and uh, early math. So we started with the implementation 2014-15 from the first day of school through November 8th. The assessment window is typically from, uh, and, and will be enforced next year, I mean this year, next school year, that it'll be um, from the first day of school through November 1st. But we had to add a week <clears throat> because we, we had some uh, delays in the rollout in some of the counties. All 3,700 kindergarten teachers are administering it during that uh, time frame, and they assess the skills and behaviors of the children as they come in. But the measure is on the skills that they bring to kindergarten. So it's really um, uh, skills and abilities that they have either learned at home, in all sorts of settings, before they start school, and um, so we're really looking at the skills that are more or less pre-kindergarten skills. And the teacher uses this assessment with three types of um, assessment formats. The first one is uh, observational rubrics. And I need to mention that the observational rubrics uh, make about 50% of the assessment. Um, but in order to make sure that the teachers are trained to use the same lens when they do the observation, um, they are uh, involved in a simulator as part of their training to go through a number of um, test items, if you will, as part of the assessment. and. And the cut score that we established for teachers to be assessors is that 80% of their results match up with the master score that we have. So it's, a, you know, in the business, a process to get some inter-rated reliability in place for those uh, assessors that are involved in an observational or indirect measure. 
the, um, the, this particular aspect of the training was one of the success stories in the professional development because teachers really like the aspect of having an opportunity to do that and most of the teachers, the vast majority of the teachers had no problems with meeting the cut score. The other pieces are we had content assessment. That means that the um, teachers were assessed on the content of the assessment so that they would have a better understanding of what is being assessed. And that speaks to the validity of uh, the, the use of the uh, assessment for teachers to have a good understanding as to how to administer it. 50% or so of the items are performance tasks. The performance tasks are standardized. We wanted this from the beginning to have that in there because the, um, if you will, flaws in they had in the MMSR was that it's strictly speaking an indirect measure with observation, but there we needed some anchors that would give us some reliability on some of the um, standards that have been measured so that we would uh, work with the performance-based test items primarily in language literacy and in the math domains. I wanted to go back to the piece. There was a big discussion about you know, going into this with standardized items, whether it's developmentally appropriate and whether it would just be um, a piece that would uh, create uh, some concerns in especially the early childhood community. But I think the advice that the assessment consultant gave us um, was very, if you have a way to directly measure foundation skill, measure them directly. Okay. And, and I, th I remember that as, as one that, in, as, as a good advice. Um, oh, I'm going backwards. What is going on here? Do you this? Okay. Um, these are the performance levels. Um, you can see for yourself what, this, uh, what demonstrating, approaching, and emerging readiness are defined as, but it's very important that uh, I want to point out that these are different, so different nomenclature that we had with MMSR. Um, the demonstrating readiness was this full readiness concept that we had in MMSR, and the emerging readiness was the developing readiness that we had in MMSR. So emerging readiness is now the new term used for children that come in with uh, a, a lack or deficiency in some of the foundational skills and behaviors which need to be addressed when the kids come into kindergarten. And when we look at the data, that number is relatively high, and it is a, an issue that I would like to discuss with you. This is Maryland's uh, demographic file, and I wanted to point out to the far right here at the bottom, you see the free reduced price meals. Almost 50% of our kids coming in fall into that category, which is really amazing because in previous uh, years, let's say prior to the economic downturn, we had about a third of those kids in there, and it's really increased. The other group that has increased over the last five or six years, the English language learners, now 16% of the population. We will talk a little bit about the gaps a little later, the gaps that we had seen in the, uh, in the, in the administration of the assessment, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the assessment results. And um, uh, that, number of English language learners, 16%, and low income, 50%, is really going to be a huge, huge um, challenge for all of us working with young children to address those needs. Children with disabilities is about 9%. That's pretty steady, has been steady over the last few years. Uh, there's not a major um, change there. These are the, that's the headline measure, if you will. The overall results, these are the new benchmarks that we're working with. And um, I've just come off, and that's why I was a little late, because Baltimore Sun had uh, called and wanted to have some information for an article. 
And they asked, you know, how come we have such difference in the results? And there are really three reasons. I mentioned that at the board, too. The first one is that the MMSR um, and the KRA are aligned to do two different curricula frameworks or standards. The MMSR was aligned to the Maryland State Curriculum, and the KRA is aligned to the Maryland College and Career Standards. Those two standards, K-12, you know, the, the state curriculum as well as the, um, or compared to the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards is huge. The, um, the, the expectations that have been set within the uh, new standards are considerably higher and therefore it had its impact on the lower grades including pre-K. And so there were, that, that's the first difference. You know, we, we, 12 years ago when we did the MMSR, we prepared them for the state curriculum. Now we're preparing for a new curriculum which is at a higher level, it's more challenging. It's more challenging because it requires more for kids to think differently and to learn somewhat differently than what we had in our state curriculum. Um, this, this, uh, the second piece is the measures are different. The MMSR, as I just mentioned, was a measure that looked at seven domains of learning and aggregated the information a little differently than the way we're doing it now with the KRA, which has four domains. And again, as I explained, it's a different assessment format. And then the third one, which I find the most intriguing aspect of the big change, had to do with the whole standard setting process. And that has to do with a way in how you look at your results, your scores that come in, and where you set the cut scores. And that is, sounds a little technical, but what it does is, is, it is the conversation about saying, what are the skills that the kids would need to come in to be prepared for that curricular level of um, learning in kindergarten as teachers define it as part of their professional expertise. 25 teachers from Ohio and Maryland came together and worked on a shortened version of the KRA, I'll speak to that in a minute, and set those standards over three days. Judy, I couldn't go to that one, but Judy was there and Candy were at this, and so if you have questions about that, they can give you some details. And so they really settled down after four rounds of going through that discussion that there are certain skills that they really wanted to see kids have bring in that defined those cuts and uh, that cut is relatively high. And it was, uh, you know, this was a group from diverse settings, you know, urban schools, suburban schools, rural areas, people with different work experiences that came together and had uh, made that decision and that's what we settled on. So I think the results are, in my view, uh, to a great extent a result of how that was set. It is interesting that we had the same process 14 years ago, I remember it, when we got the teachers together and said, where do we set the standards and saying this would be considered full, fully ready, you know? So we brought the teachers in and they went through the process. It wasn't the same one that we had here, but they wanted to really start higher than what your typical average would be. And sure enough, we started in 2001 with results that were 49% fully ready, and I don't know what the rest was, but it was, uh, uh, there were fewer in that category, in the emerging category, which we called developing at that point. So, we're basically doing a reset. We're working now with a new benchmark. We're working new curricular framework. 
And I think what we're doing is we are now in the process of informing the early childhood community and also those that work in the lower grades as teachers that there is going to be a huge effort, must be a huge effort on, on the way to turn the curve on this one. In other words, to increase the number of kids that would fall into this category over the next few years, demonstrating readiness. This is a breakout by subgroups. Um, and she's, um, we, we put gender down in the um, race and ethnicity. And here, it is very interesting. It's just the same pattern that we saw in the MMSR. In that regard, the measures, or the results of using those two measures, give us similar patterns. It's just a different um, result, relatively lower than what we had before. This is, uh, I find, very important. And you might want to look at the uh, information you get in the little booklet that Ready at Five had put together, which includes the uh, uh, jurisdictional data. These are the four domains that we um, settled on, and that's the shorter version of the KRA. We call it 1.5. That's the one that we used for standard setting. This is not then the layout of the domains that the teachers used in the fall. They still had science in there, and then they had uh, social studies in there. And this was collapsed into those, or they were taken out, those items, to shorten the assessment. The reason we shortened it had to do with the pushback we got from teachers that they were overburdened with the assessment in combination with other requirements that they had to meet during a very short time span. And you probably heard about that. We really had to come back with a way to resolve this and fix it in a way. And one of the, the way we address the concerns is by shortening the KRA. And it is still a very valid tool. We had uh, you know, worked through that with our assessment consultant. And so we ended up with these four domains. And I think this is still a very comprehensive measure in that respect. So you see the, the differences here. Um, mathematics, that the math scores across the jurisdictions. What we found was, relatively speaking, lower than it, for any, uh, compared to the other three domains. So um, my first question is, uh, we, um, did we miss the boat on some early math? Uh, for, for young kids, and that I can see as an area that some of the jurisdictions might want to work on. We're also generating school reports, by the way, that are being sent out. In fact, I had heard they were sent out to the jurisdictions so that the school reports can go to the principals, and they can be informed about what the results are on these four domains, because that may give, you, may give them a very good um, starting point to have a discussion with their teachers as to how those um, particular domains and areas can be addressed instructionally within their programs, within their classrooms. Um, this is the, the first um, uh, slide about the gaps. 21% um, <coughs> that's higher than what we had in the MMSR. It didn't measure a, a gap as wide as this. 21%, that's um, fairly big, 57% in the middle and high income group and 36% low income. That means that um, two thirds of the kids from low income, kids, uh, uh, low income um, families are either <coughs> in the emerging or in the approaching category. It was produced by our department and it has an appendix B in there that provides information more than you want to really deal with in terms of the jurisdictional results. And it does include a piece that talks about these no score uh, information at the bottom of each of uh, the uh, county results so that you have a better understanding that some information did not get worked into those numbers 
because of the situation that Judy just explained. Um, let me talk just about, at, at some point I'd like to talk about the administration or uh, levels of support that we had uh, for children with disabilities and English language learners and how we're going to address that uh, this uh, year coming up. Okay. Um, so these are um, the results for English language literacy. I mean, I'm sorry, for language and literacy for those three um, categories or subgroups. And uh, there, again, is a huge F, um, uh, you know, challenge to, to address these gaps. And we will see over the next few years as to whether we've been successful. Um, that question came up, of course, at the board meeting today. And you know, the race to the top efforts with all the projects is meant to address that. And now with this new measure, it really just looks as very big. So more to do. That's for math. Now let's talk about predominant care. This is the prior care category. And we have, this may be hard to read, but you have it in front of you, of course. The largest group is pre-K. Um, it's always been. Um, then we have uh, the home and informal care group. And that is larger than what we had in the past. We had about 89, uh, 18, 19% before now, it comes at 23%. Uh, and we, um, I had that number checked twice to see what we find in there, and that's how it turned out. Um, then child care centers had start. This is Head Start, a non-public nursery, and uh, the child care centers up here. So this is the breakout in percentage of all the kids that have been included in this analysis for predominant care. This does not include the kids that, have, that are in dual settings, like in Head Start and in family child care in the afternoon. You know, there's still in our data set information about that. So that's the predominant prior care. This is the breakout for these groups. And I need to just mention that there are pre-selected groups in here in terms of their enrollments. And that's mentioned here on the slide. Head Start and pre care are almost um, exclusively from low income fa uh, families. And therefore, that has an impact on the results for those groups. So that's pre-K and then the low income. Now, how do you use the, the, the tool? Um, and we've been uh, really stressing the importance for teachers to use the information. They currently, typically in the school system, have no other instrument that would be as comprehensive as the KRA. And so this is information they can use as a baseline for their class. And um, the only sort of uh, complication in all of this was because the standard setting process was not completed in the first year, the reporting devices that we built into the system have not been able, you know, teachers couldn't able to access that so they could get the reports the, the you know, classroom profile, individual student profiles immediately as it was planned in the development of it. But now since we have the standard setting done, that will be available as they you know, implement the, or administer the uh, assessment in the fall. You belong to this group, um, either here or in here, where you have, um, of course, responsibility or accountability for groups of kids and how they're doing in your programs. If you're, for instance, an administrator for a local agency that's responsible for, for early childhood services, that data is going to report on your groups of kids in your jurisdiction and really should be informative in terms of what the next steps might be in your discussion with your key leaders in supporting children and improve the school readiness skills for those kids and what can be done. 
The data is meant, among other information, uh, for early childhood um, councils to use the information. That's sort of a given because they went through the results-based accountability leadership program, any of those. And of course, that's designed to work with uh, performance measures, and the KRA is the one that those councils will be using. Now, for families, uh, we fell short a little bit this year because, again, for the standard setting, we didn't have the scores in time. And we had um, come down on the business rule for this year that we would send out the individual student records, and it was up to the teacher to share that with the parents. We felt that when we, because of the delay of several months to have the information out for families, it might cause greater confusion than it would be helpful. So uh, starting, of course, this upcoming school year, that information will be available right at the point when the teachers have their conferences with their parents. So this is going to get resolved that way. Um, do you want to talk about the uh, individual student record that has been produced and will be sent out to the local school systems? They will then use that information and have it in the folder or shared with families. So for this year, um, all the school systems have the flexibility to decide whether they still want to send home the individual student report this late because it does reflect how they were doing back in the fall. It may not be an accurate reflection of how they're doing now. Um, so they do have to put a copy in the student file because we have to report scores but most of the school systems I believe are just going to let the parents know that those that information is available and they could contact the child's teacher if they'd like to find out how they were doing back in the fall <coughs> so that'll be their option next year the teachers will be able to pull those reports when they uh, two weeks after the window closes in November they'll be able to print out the score reports for parents, which will include not just the number scores and the which band they're in demonstrating or um, emerging, but it will also give them information on some ideas for how to help their child. So it'll actually be a four-page kind of report, and that'll be available in um, English, Chinese, French, and Spanish. The teacher could print out, pick one of those other languages that that would help send that home to. We really um, are fortunate to have Luis Corbin and Radiate 5 to uh, work with us on getting the information released at the same time. Uh, when I show you this kind of report that's printed in our office, it is, has all the information you want, but it's not nearly as attractive <laughs> and promotional as the um, nice little booklet that you all have in front of you. And um, this has really helped us um, to get the information out to, to many um, stakeholders. You sent the information. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit, as to how many we printed, and then where this is going? I'm scheduled to be in Montgomery County tomorrow morning to report on that. And so it was very handy to have a Montgomery County report right there and then. So it's. Um, it's, it's uh, uh, really a great partnership, um, and uh, it gets us to places that we probably wouldn't have been uh, over the last few years if it hadn't been with your involvement, uh, Louise. I mean, I can say that the business community has always been interested in early childhood, and they like data, so we went to them, but it was your engagement to get us there, and then uh, there's something scheduled next week uh, with that group and with foundations. And I think it has made a difference, a huge difference from, in terms of resources and buy-in to um, our work. So uh, I'm open to questions. Um, you know, may not be the only one I can answer it. I need to say that um, for the most part, uh, Judy, Walker and Candy Miller, and to some extent Bob, who is responsible for professional development, have been the key um, 
staff on the KRA and on the uh, Ready for Kindergarten project in general. And uh, I've done an incredible job in you know, attending to the details that need to be done uh, with this. Many of you were involved in subgroups, in um, uh, ad hoc groups. And so uh, we really thank you too to be um, having been involved in this. Uh, when you look at this report in the back, your name may show up. <laughs> because if you had been in any of these, um, the, the development phase of it. We have, um, we have a national technical advisory committee. There are 13 members from all over the country and they're mostly content specialists. They really helped us on reviewing the learning progressions to see that this tool is developmentally appropriate. We had, um, a state advisory group, by the way, they're meeting again, Candy, when? Thursday. On Thursday. That advisory group was involved in giving us feedback. We had um, a group on accessibility accommodations for special populations. We had ad hoc committee members. We had folks involved in pilots, cognitive interviews, and field trips. Any schools and... What did I say? Field trips. <laughs> oh, sorry, field <laughs> tests. Yeah. And um, that, so that's really a, a huge statewide engagement in this. And um, uh, so I'm ready for any questions that you have. Yes, Lisa. they're always asking us is we wish we knew how our kids were doing in your programs. We're giving them sort of a general statement that they want to know more detailed information. So I'm curious if I need to pursue in my okay. district getting that information or if that's something that's... That's almost like a planted question. I forgot <laughs> about <laughs> talking about that. You know, the data is, you, I mean, the, 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 the data that we have is just so massive that we can uh, do uh, quite a bit with it. And that what, what I'm uh, referring to is secondary analysis. So if you're working with the childcare community, either you or we can, you meaning a school system, or we at the Department of Education can take the data and look and, and answer queries, answer questions that any group might have. Let's see. With childcare, for instance, they may be interested in how does this breakout with subgroups work for us? What is, you know, how are low income kids in a child, in child care centers doing in our county? And what specific information do we have maybe on uh, certain other subgroups that are not like, you know, African American males, you know? So if, if there are these queries, uh, you can pick them up from your stakeholder group and send them to us, and we'd be glad to run the report. One thing we cannot do is we cannot share uh, identifiable information with any of you other than a local school system. And so that's uh, uh, the easiest way to get information done, and we have now uh, a way to turn over these reports fairly quickly. So just to keep on that line of thinking, so I have X, Y, and Z child care centers who specifically are asking me how their children are doing. Is it, is it my um, responsibility as a school system leader to say, okay, well, then if you're willing to you know, give no, us... No, they can go directly to us. They can. We've done this before uh, with the MMSR. There were a number of groups, child care centers, or you know, especially childcare centers that might have 10, 15 programs out there. Head Start it was involved in something we did a couple of years ago with the delegate agencies. So that uh, request, they can come to us and then we can filter for that information. As long as we have the enrollment information with the five identifiable 
uh, with the layout that we need in order to do the match. Our uh, enrollment and attendance reporting system, which you might have heard as part of Race to the Top, is not going to be <coughs> as helpful this year because it's just going to take at least another year or so until we have enough programs signing up to that so that we have that data um, in, you know, uh, in, in our early childhood data warehouse. But um, for the time being, if there is, like, if your Head Start program is interested in that information, you can just give us an Excel file with last name, middle initial, first name, date of birth, and um, gender. We can get pretty much unique identifiers that way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a quick way to um, handle that. And uh, we will also look at the Title I schools, in particular, as part of Race to the Top, that includes the Trudy Centers. And on their results, and of course you as a Trudy, as Trudy Center coordinators will be working with the results as well. That would be a critical piece now, since you have them. Uh, but uh, the, we will work with the Title I schools because obviously the early childhood pro programs in those Title I schools are the ones that we want to target. So, here are the results of the school. You feed those kids in the school. These are the needs of the school as we've detected that through the assessment now. And we want to impact that uh, through your work in uh, child care centers, nursery, family, child care homes. For some time, and you recently actually have talked about this um, with regard to the data in the past. But I'm wondering how many of our farm children, um, of those eligible for farm, are English language learners and or children with disabilities? Good, good, yeah. So you can look at, ki there are kids in there that ha might have a disability, are English language learners, and are low income. You have kids in there that are low income English language learners. And Head Start might be interested in many, what's the breakout, demographic breakout for uh, their population? So we can do that. All you need to do is to give us the query on what you want to have answered and then we'll figure out the rest as to how we're going to do it on the dashboard. Does that answer your question? It does. I, actually, when I looked at my Judy Center children and took out the children who were not dual language learners and children with disabilities, the farm scores were very different. And so that was what generated my thought about mm -hmm. maybe we need to look at this in one other aspect, which is just those who are yeah. without these complicating um, variables. Whatever question your group has, you know, your team, your steering committee, you know, send them to us and then we'll process them as they come in. Yes, Kathy. Um, Data access all the way down at, and, and filter for each of those. Yes. And, and, and you have, that's yeah. on Tumbleweed right now okay. by school. Okay. But, but by classroom and by individual students. Yes, because the teacher is identified. So you have, you have access to it through Tumbleweed. And, and you work with your accountability chief or okay. you know, person. And I think that's the pro so appropriate to way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carrie yeah. created a report by school, okay. school level report. Well, that's what that will be on the aggregate. I think what. Uh, yeah, I have the school report, but I don't yeah, have what, what do you, classroom. What, right. But the whole the, file is. The, is what we call problem. the flat file with the child level data, that should be on Tumbleweed for you to be picked up, or for your whoever is working with you on the on the data analysis. If you don't have it, give us a call or let us know, and then we'll get it to you. Um, so because you have a new tool, the scores look very different, and there are stakeholders in jurisdictions who may have some trouble understanding that. Is there an intention for an alignment document or something? For my county council and my county. Yeah. <laughs> Please. 
Yeah, I think um, uh, we have information about the assessment itself online that's actually handled through CTE at Johns Hopkins. And uh, Judy can get you, um, or Wendy, who is working from our office with all the councils, can get that out. I think what people might want to find out is what the assessment is all about, uh, why we're doing this, uh, what's the purpose, and then also learn a little more about the early learning assessment, because many of the early childhood stakeholders will be involved in that. The kindergarten readiness assessment is a tool for kindergarten teachers. You know, the pre-K teachers or Head Start folks won't use it. They will just get results on it. But the ELA, the, uh, the uh, early uh, learning assessment, that's the tool that I can see folks that work with three and four year olds will be using. And so that is, um, as I said, last few months of development and will be out this summer and fall for training um, there's, first of all, a training of trainers, and then there'll be uh, a rollout to, I think our benchmark in the Race to the Top is 1,300 um, teachers uh, to be trained on the ELA. So yeah. part of what I'm asking about is, I, I probably misspoke, is not ECACs and those folks, I'm talking about the political town council. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna see this as first glance it's 40 points lower than it was before. So I'm just talking about mm -hmm. the way they calibrate and line up with each other in terms of for people who are not in early childhood education aren't following all this. Yeah. We have to get that across them easily and quickly. Uh, we know, we know that this is going to take um, a lot of explaining and uh, it, it is probably something that we would need to do as far as um, as part of a handout to make the, the difference clear. This may be a, a document we can prepare for the meeting next week. And sure. then, not, not, <laughs> I'm saying we can prepare it and have it available. But it's something that uh, I think we want to stress as to how do you interpret that information in light of the fact that we had, you know, 13 years of, of the MMSR with all its trend lines going up and and, um, and then I think once it's explained as being just, you know, you're on different plateaus, you know, you prepare kids on, on a higher level. I have this thing analogy, it's a little, little um, phony, but it, it's a, you know, you have kids that go, I mean, it was high jump, you know, the high jump analogy. So, you know, typically athlete might manage to get over seven feet, right? So we have, over the last 13 years, we've practiced to get more kids over, you know, across the seven feet height, you know. And so eight out of 10 were doing it by the time we finished with all of that. Now we are raising it to seven and a half feet. And we find out that five of them can do it. So that's pretty good. But we want to get more kids to, you know, jump over that level. It's that, it's, you know, it's, it's a little hokey, but it might help. Until next Tuesday when we get this new document. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it before then. Okay. <laughs> well, I can speak to that tomorrow at this. Are you going to be at this yeah, event? Probably come on. Yeah. yeah. So Shannon had to hand up. Well, I, I'm, I would love to have something to help. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good. And explanation to make it really simple and clear. Um, that would be very, very helpful. And that, thank you for mm -hmm. bringing that up. Because um, I've been asked to write a statement that goes either way. Right, so I wanna... Yeah, I think that, that I think it's sort of like talking points yes. that we can give you to, you know, explain it to the folks, you know, and and you know, it, um, well, you gave flustered. Three reasons earlier. Yeah, that was good. I have the right too, so I hope you've got them. So I got them. Yes. I said never need it. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, I will get something out early next week. Um, early next week is Monday. Is a holiday, so. Probably by Wednesday next week that we can give you is nothing you know as beautiful as all these publications, but it'll be let's say talking points that you can use with your uh, community or communities. Actually, we could rig it up. We could uh, with the text uh, make 
think of a close to this. Yeah. yeah. We can put it together. Mm -hmm. And it'll look like a companion piece. Uh, it's so, good. So my real so, question. Okay. The real that, question. That wasn't it. Um, was that I, I'm not able to get that document uploaded um, here. And it may just be a connection issue or maybe there's a link issue. Which, the, the this one, document? Yes. That document. And so I'm curious if in the back it has similar information that you provided through the MMSR that we can pull out and say, you know what, the sample size was this. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Candy can speak to that. Candy actually worked in the technical information in this report, which we don't have in the promotional okay. materials. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't know what specifically you're looking for, but um, everything's in there in terms of regarding the um, reliability of the assessment, the standards that were assessed, um, the process we went through for standard setting, all of that's part of this. Um, and then, of course, once you get to the appendix that has the state results, that's where you would find the sample sizes. Great. Um, they would be in that. And the question and answer piece in the back is good. Yeah. I think that by its frequently asked question, section is, is, is helpful for somebody who has a lot of questions about that. It's, it, we really answered quite a few of the st standard questions that folks have. We're just curious, where were you trying out the link that wouldn't open? So directly from the press release that was just issued, yeah. and I hit that, and then I actually hit the link, and I wasn't able to pull it up. And I don't know if it's it's going question. to the MSD website. Yeah. I think yeah. they have it. Um, yeah. There's, there's one I'm missing. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so there's an issue with that. Okay. Yeah, but um, uh, some folks, some folks didn't. I tried the same thing. I got an error yeah. file, and then other folks were able to get in. So I, uh, I don't know. They told me to refresh it. So you know. Okay. Okay. And the one that you're looking for is with the blue shade, yes. because the one with the green shade is the uh, is the Radiate Five report. I'll make it more confusing for you all. Okay. <laughs> then. Rob, Rob uh, yeah, the old work sampling, one of the really valuable things with the old process was that uh, pre-K, Head Start, all, could, could you have a lot of that material to design training and uh, you know work plans and so on? Because we could see those scores. So one of the, this, the, the readiness assessment in terms of its utility to, to the pre-kindergarten world uh, is something that we would use, not just look at in terms of results, because it leads back to individual classrooms, it leads, we, we can lead it back to individual teachers, for example, yeah. and structure a whole curriculum of training around a lot of information and data that we used to collect. Are we it was unclear, and I apologize for walking in late. I, had, I think I had my time wrong. But so, can we still do that? Yes. I mean, this is really uh, very important. Uh, and this sort of worked for MMSR very well. The data is one thing, but we wanted to make sure that it is, um, in, in, that there's a curricular alignment, a continuum in place from early childhood into the public schools. And so, we will be developing professional development modules that can be used for pre-K and in K and following or basing it on the guide that we just published. I, mean, I didn't bring it with me, but um, it is the uh, Guide to Early Childhood Pedagogy. It's a blue book and it has, uh, I believe, eight chapters. and. Um, we wanted to develop modules that follow those chapters and unpack that and provide that information to or disseminate it through the community. Um, and we're just working on that for the rest of the year and probably into early next year to get those established and then being disseminated. It's worked very well for MMSR and I believe it, it'll work very Can well. Can you do for a follow-up to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's great, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I knew you were working on that, but to make it concrete, the example, I'll just use it as an example. We might find in Garrett County that we have a Head Start classroom that over two years running all of a sudden had a drop in scores in literacy or science or whatever it is. 
that told us immediately that we had a staff person or we had some, re some reason to look at that and do something different. And that's what I'm looking for here, so that we could go back and, and do that kind of analysis and, and create, create program around it. Okay. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. For teachers, we were going to have a lot of resources available for teachers to do it with individual kids. So that'll be built into the ELA extensively and into the KRA. So for instance, if there are any gaps, and then Judy can speak to the details, if there are any gaps that a teacher would identify by looking at the profile, they may be at a loss what to do with certain kids in the executive functioning skill area, for instance. And then there will be resources available for the teacher to work with that. Several resources, the electronic learning community, getting feedback from other teachers across the state, or this, uh, the, uh, the other format is to just have resources available that they can access. I think, when, I think what you're getting at is you'd like to know exactly what the assessment scores are reflecting, which standards, you know, so that you could look at curriculum and see if there's a... Mm -hmm. Disaggregate to the point where we can kind of focus a lot of our, our programming around certain opportunity for need. It's Appendix A. You're looking okay. at A. So in, in this one, in Appendix A, is the common language standards? Do we have um, Wi-Fi? Can we bring up the... Yeah. Are what we, uh, what Wes said, wrote the items from. So if you want to see what... So you can see what, uh, what we assessed, specifically in language and literacy, what we assessed in math, if you're looking for that kind of detail. So you want to see if the curriculum that the teachers teach you cover those things. You can use that as kind of a reference. So that's oh. one, one suggestion. The other will be the early learning assessment, the formative assessment. If you think about the continuum of those assessment items in that system, which is kind of like the work sampling, you know, I had the different levels in the work sampling system. Um, there'll be items for, the, for different age bands and there's five levels in there from 36 to 72 months and like level four is those items are similar to what's on the KRA it's the same age kind of span and then there are items below and items above it so that would be another tool that you could use to see are you is the teacher teaching the same things that will be you know on the KRA? I, 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 you? Judy I think it would it be was. helpful to talk about <laughs> It would be helpful to talk about the learning progressions. That might be a good starting point. The 20, 28 learning progressions. That's your rib cage, if you will. That's your structure of the assessment framework. And the, they, are, they were developed from 36 months to 72 months. And there are five levels. And at level four is where the KRA is settled, more or less. And then we are now working on bringing that down to birth. And so I think we can maybe set up seminars or something that would help, you know, key stakeholders get an understanding a little bit more how this was put together and then how you can use those parts in your instructional design. So when you talk about learning progression, you're talking about, let's see, on numeracy. How does it translate back to a level one for maybe a three-year-old, okay? So what are the steps in between to get to the point to um, be ready on numeracy as it's defined through the items and measuring the standard? It, it is a, is a if, if you just want information on the assessment itself, then that might be the way we can start with, with these learning progressions. If it's just a matter of going good practices in early math, that's what I was referring to earlier. But just get folks involved in some good practices in early May. Then once they're, they're well implemented in high fidelity, you get many kids to that, to that level. Here is the, what we're talking about. Domain strand standard. The items have been developed for the essential skills, behaviors. These are the learning progressions. So we have one on measurement. Let's take that example. That reflects this standard. 
and then an assessment process for these essential skills, for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, okay? And what I thought you were saying is, how can we help teachers who work with three-year-olds learn what they need to do to get kids to do well? Let's say it's just on the measurement progression, okay? And, the and, and working with the learning progression might be the, the starting point. That's what I was saying. So and I think for that, that needs to be processed in terms of professional development modules, either online or face-to-face. -face. And we're, we're getting there. We're working on that. I already have it's the names of kids <coughs> with each center, but I don't have a place to enter that. It's me making a separate Excel spreadsheet with kids that were in certain centers mm -hmm. and then sending it to you guys and asking you to Data. If you can facilitate that, that would be fine. It needs to have these five mm -hmm. data points. Um, so like when do you want to wait until the, er, the ears is out? Because the, that's the enrollment and intensive reporting system. Once that's out, you know, many of the Howard County programs may just sign on. It's an online system, a child care center. Well, it is being piloted right now. UAT is scheduled with providers in May, this told me, which is now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we won't really have it out for providers to use until later this year. But um, the answer for 16, 17 is ears to a great extent, because we will have programs that will sign up and have enrollment information right in there and get their assigned SAS it. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's the. Uh, Long now, unless you wanted to do it for this year and get enrollment information to us. We do a retreat with child care directors anyway, so yeah. we could say, if you mm -hmm. want to know, we can facilitate that That's happening and just compile it all into one charge. That'd be fine. We can, we can make that work. It's, we definitely will do it for the pre-K expansion sites. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a requirement under the grant, and so we have uh, that set up. Um, so anyhow, that was just to give you a sense. When you look at that, that uh, book, there's the full framework in there for social foundations uh, for all four domains. And uh, that might give you a very good idea as to what's in that assessment, what's being assessed, what's being looked at. Okay? All right. We have that, that too. People are always wondering how our programs are doing in the county, so that's another. Yeah, and that's something we can generate okay. um, this summer, is to look at all these uh, kids that are in dual settings, and so yeah, that that's already in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions, Shannon? So just curious about the early learning assessment. You said you're piloting it in, with 1,300 teachers. Not piloting. This is a dissemination of making sure that, you know, folks that work in child care centers, Head Start programs, get the training on the um, ELA. Okay. But we won't really have that until this winter. Okay, so, so then feasibly we could look at the following year as fully, as Head Start programs are considering using that, that that would be the year where we could get a full year's worth you can, yeah, the ELA is meant to sort of stay in the classroom or with the program or in, you know, we're not looking at having that aggregated, you know. And we, um, the, the ELA is probably akin to what the MMSR used to be kind of thing. It's, it's mostly, if not exclusively, observational rubrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With that age group and uh, so... Yeah, I think it, it'll be interesting on the learning progressions itself to, to have this conversation and how you articulate um, kids from a, a Head Start program into a, pre uh, a kindergarten program, you know, working with those learning progressions and might be a, another phase where we can <coughs> really go back into these articulation uh, meetings that Head Start and 
kindergarten teachers have, um, which is something we did in the MMSR in the first few years. Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, I'll take it back to Louise. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. I sure. Think